Good morning, church. Uh, I'll be reading from, as, as Josh said, Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 20 through to the end of the chapter. Please listen to the word of God. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed, and the one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together, the one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field, the one will be taken and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thanks so much, Josh. Lovely worship today and welcome to any visitors that are with us today. We're glad that you're with us. Welcome. Please take your Bibles and uh, turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 17, the passage that Andrew read out for us a little bit earlier. And I trust that we had enough uh, bulletins to go around and that you can open to the inner page and have um, uh, some words there, some scriptures that we'll be using as we move through the message that you're able to follow and trust that that's a blessing to you also. We've been doing a series in Jesus' words through the Gospels, and the title of this morning's message is, Don't Forget to Be Ready. Please, dear friends, don't forget to be ready. Let's pray. Dear Father, we do pray that as we come to your word, you might open it out to us with all the power and love of the Lord Jesus that we've been singing about. In his name we pray, amen. I've been talking to a young man about knowing God uh, for about 18 months now. Uh, It's been mainly by text, but just recently I was able to spend some time with him personally. I asked him if he had been reading the Bible, and he said that he hadn't. Uh, He just sees the Bible as a book written by man, just like any other book, and he doesn't see how it could possibly help. And I think that he's waiting for some kind of supernatural experience Uh, to know for sure that God exists. Uh, But my point to him was that the Bible is a supernatural experience. Everywhere in the Bible is the fingerprint of God. Everywhere in the Bible is evidence that it is God's love letter to us so that we might know know him in love and and know how to live. Uh, It is written over a period of 2,000 years by something like 40 different authors. And yet there is a single theme, there is a, um, a coherency in it. It is without any error. And that is miraculous. Forty different men over thousands of years, and yet it is consistently saying the one thing, the one message. It is miraculous. Hundreds of prophecies have been fulfilled. None have failed, not one. So the book is amazing with the fingerprint of God on its pages. 
So I encouraged him again to start reading, explaining him that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He claimed, well, if there is a God there, he, he will understand my doubts and it's all going to be okay. Yet, yeah, no, it's not going to be okay. Uh, so I talked to him about a man that we both knew well that's now passed away. That man had lived an extremely moral life, an exemplary life, but he wasn't saved until he was in his 80s. And I made the point to the young man um, that until this older man had trusted Christ as his saviour from sin, he was not going to be saved, even though he had lived such a good and exemplary life. The young man replied, well, I'm in trouble then. I said, yes, you're in big trouble. At that point, circumstances separated us and I haven't had a chance to get back to him again. I wonder what God has been doing in his life. May I say very kindly to you, if you're not actively trusting Christ's death in your place, you are in big trouble. May I say transparently, I want to help you with that today. In this church, we've been studying the life of Jesus Christ in pretty fine detail, going through the Gospels, listening to his words, uh, watching what he did. We're now only, as far as the Gospel accounts are are concerned, only weeks away from his death. Uh, It's going to take us much longer. And by the way, weeks away from his death means that you're only halfway through the Gospels uh, because so much is written about the end of Jesus' life. And the Saviour's preaching preaching just a couple of weeks away from his death is absolutely crucial. As the crowds follow Jesus, some religious men, very, very religious men who do not know God, had a question for him. We read in verse 20, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees, that's these religious men, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. So, So these men coming, when will the kingdom of God come? So all that follows in verses 20 through 37 in this chapter is about the kingdom of God. Jesus is answering uh, their question. In answer to their question, Jesus gives two broad descriptions of the kingdom of God. The first broad description of the kingdom of God is what the kingdom of God is like now. I mean, like when Jesus lived and actually as it is still today. Now, these religious Pharisees who claimed to know God but did not know him Actually, know the scriptures. Actually, knew the scriptures pretty well. That's true of the cults today. They might know the, God, the the Bible thoroughly. They might be able to quote verses to you better than you can quote them yourself. But as yet, they do not know God. Well, these Pharisees knew what we call what we call the Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament. They just called it the scriptures. They knew that the Old Testament promised a coming kingdom and a coming king who would rule that kingdom. Let me give you just an example of just a a couple of the prophecies that they would have been aware of. First of all on your sheet, Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto you a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government or his kingdom, and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order and establish, so he'd be a descendant of David, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So it's very clear that those verses are talking about a king and a kingdom, and that king would be after the order of King David. Uh, This king would be, according to uh, verse 6, wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. So this king that would would be to come would be mighty God. He would be a man, a descendant of David. Speaking of this man, Isaiah 11 and verse 2 says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him and the the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, 
in other words, by externals. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, his faithfulness the belt of his waist. He will know the very truth from the heart because he knows all things. And of his kingdom, the next verse continues, the wolf uh, shall also dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Let's have a summary. Verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So during the kingdom of this king, there is going to be such a pervasive peace uh, that we know. We know it certainly hasn't come as it's spoken of there in Isaiah, even now. There will be a pervasive peace across this earth. So the Pharisees 2,000 years ago are waiting for the kingdom spoken of in the Old Testament. And they want to know what Jesus has to say about the kingdom of God. Regarding the kingdom at that time, which persists right through to our present day, Jesus gave two features. The king had arrived in his first coming. So this is his kingdom he's speaking of. The, the first feature of the present kingdom is it is a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. Verse 20 says, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. It doesn't come with observation because it's not a physical, spirit, it's not a, a, a physical visible kingdom. So, by the way, any denomination that claims that they are the only church of Jesus Christ, some visible representation of the kingdom, that denomination has just announced themselves not to be the true church of God. Uh, when, the king, um, was, when the king was being cross-examined right at the end of his life, uh, this is what he said to the Romans. Pilate was the examiner at this time. We read in John 18 and verse 37. You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And my kingdom is not of this world. Not, it's not a physical kingdom, it's a spiritual kingdom. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So Jesus said it again right at the end of his life. Yes, it, it is a spiritual, non-visible -vis kingdom. So Jesus adds in verse 21, Nor will they say, see here or see there, for the kingdom of God is within you, the verse says. Now, Jesus certainly wasn't saying to the unsaved Pharisees. He's speaking to the Pharisees here. He wasn't saying to the unsaved Pharisees, the kingdom of God is within you, you unsaved men. He's in your heart. Of course not. They did not know the king. A clearer translation is given on your sheet. Uh, verse 21, Nor will they say, look here or there, for behold, the kingdom of uh, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's exactly the same words in Greek, can be translated the other way, and it's that one that makes more sense. You as plural, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you all, Jesus is saying. Some know the king and are in the kingdom. Some do not know the king and are not in the kingdom of God. Both then and now, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Some are saved, some are not. Looking out at you, I can't tell who of you is in the kingdom and who is not in the kingdom. Uh, so the kingdom of God is, a, is spiritual and invisible. That's how it is now, but not forever. May I ask this morning, do you know the king that you may be part of his kingdom? Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God. Do you know the king? though you may be part of his kingdom. A second feature of the present kingdom is a suffering king. After Jesus starts talking about another kingdom in verse 22, then he said to his disciples, the days will come. So he's talking about a kingdom that's coming in the future. Uh, he reverts, after he starts talking about that future kingdom, he reverts in verse 25 to the present time. He says, but first, 
Verse 25, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And of course, Jesus the King did suffer many things, especially death on the cross, having been rejected by his own. Uh, He said that would happen. And John summarizes uh, the whole of Jesus' life saying in John chapter 1 and verse 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Have you received the king this morning in your life to be part of his kingdom? Have you believed that the king died in your place for the forgiveness of your sins? If so, you've been made a child of God and you're in the kingdom. You've been born of the spirit of God. That's what those two verses said. Let's read it again in verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, because it's a spiritual kingdom, being born of God. To receive the king right now, if you were to receive the king right now, you would be part of his kingdom right now. He will now be the ruler of your life. I was talking to another young man and I asked him, um, what what are your spiritual beliefs? Do you have any spiritual beliefs? And he said, no, none, no, no, I don't have any. Okay, so what happens when you die? Does your body just rot in the ground? I asked him. He said, I don't know. I don't think about that stuff very much. That'd be a pretty typical answer out there if you went around asking people. So I answered, If there really is a God, and there really is an eternity, you need to think about it. You need to be thinking about it, because it really matters. You have a look around you. (laughs) Look across the way. Look look towards the back or the front. Can you tell who's in the kingdom of God? Uh, Just because people come to church doesn't mean they're part of the kingdom. Being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than... Being in a garage makes you a car. What are your spiritual beliefs? Who do you say that Jesus is? This morning we've seen Jesus as a king, uh, an eternal king, the God-man. Does he rule your life? Could you please answer that in your heart where you sit? Does Jesus rule your life? Do you recognize that if you turn from the way you are going, trusted Jesus Christ as your savior from sin, then you would be saved. Um, But if you haven't done that, do you recognize that you'd be in big trouble? So would it be heaven or hell for you? When would you do something about that? Would you be ready to do something about that today? Don't you want to be born of God's spirit and be part of his kingdom? The second broad description of the kingdom of God is what the coming kingdom is like. What the coming kingdom is like. Verse 22 begins, Then he said to his disciples, Okay, so maybe the Pharisees have left, or or maybe Jesus has just turned his back on the Pharisees. Anyway, he's finished talking to the Pharisees, in those few words, and now he turns to disciples to teach them more of the kingdom of God. Uh, Maybe those words, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you all, confuse the Pharisees. They were surrounded by people in the kingdom, but they were not part of it themselves. Such men uh, cannot understand the scripture. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, Uh, Verse 14, sorry. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So the Pharisees leave, apparently leave Jesus. He he talks to his disciples. They leave unsaved, and uh, Christ turns to those who are in the kingdom, and he wants to teach them more about the coming kingdom. Verse 22, we read, Then he said to his disciples, The days will come when you desire to see the days of the Son of Man 
and you will not see it. Of course, he knew that he was going to the cross. He knew that he would die. Uh, he knew that he was speaking of his resurrection and ascension and that Jesus Christ has not been here physically on planet Earth uh, since those days of his ascension to heaven, not for 2,000 years, only spiritually present. Indeed, as he said in verse 25, but first he must suffer many things and be re rejected by this generation. So Jesus knew what was ahead and he says, you're going to want to see me and I won't be here. He gives us four features of the kingdom to come. First, it will be obvious. The kingdom of God right now is not particularly obvious. Like I said, I can't see who's in and who's out. But then the kingdom will be obvious. Verse 23 says, And he said to his disciples, the, uh, Sorry, verse 23 says, And they, they will say to you, Look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning flashes out of one part of heaven... Uh, shines to the other part of heaven, so also will the Son of Man be in his day. So the coming, of, the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is obvious as lightning. You just can't miss it. It will be very visible. It will be very obvious to everyone who now doubts. Explanations and signposts will not be needed uh, for the coming kingdom of God. It will be clear to all that the kingdom has come. And so we now pray, thy kingdom come. For the kingdom in all its fullness has not yet come, that pervasive peace that, G, that the Old Testament spoke about. When it does come, people will not need to announce or tell you where to go. And I, I certainly don't need to tell you now that the kingdom hasn't come, that peace is not here. And when it does come, it won't need to be preached again. It will be obvious that it is. Second, when the kingdom comes, it will be sudden and unexpected. Jesus gives two illustrations of sudden, unexpected events that were associated with the judgment of God. Sudden and unexpected. First uh, is Noah and the second is Lot. So let's have a look at Noah first. But before I read to you what Jesus said to Noah, uh, do you believe in a worldwide flood? A flood that covered the whole earth? Jesus did. He not only believed it, he knew it was true. Um, he spoke of Noah's flood as historic fact. If you don't believe in a worldwide flood, you don't believe what Jesus knew. Of course there was a worldwide flood. The, wo the word of God proclaims it, and the world out here proclaims it. Just go to Echo Point and look at the sandstone. That sandstone is hundreds of meters thick and goes under the other layers of the earth right up into Queensland. There is no river or lake system on earth that has ever produced that. It takes a worldwide flood. It's right under our noses. The, wor the world, as well as the word, says so. So Jesus said in verse 26, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the, the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. The whole world population. Noah preached, repent, there is a coming flood and he did that for 120 years and they considered him the village idiot. Time seemed to contradict the prophecy he preached for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, decade after decade, and the flood hadn't come, therefore they assumed it would not come. However, and Noah and his family knew that the flood was coming. The, the enormous population of the earth at that time, and it was enormous, it was 1,500 years after creation, uh, the, the enormous population of the, the earth did not. Noah and his family made preparation for the flood. The world population did not. Noah and his family entered the ark, but the population of the world did not. And then finally, because they'd had chance after chance after chance, God shut the door. And they could not enter the ark. And then all hell broke loose. It was cataclysmic, apocalyptic. And once volcanic eruptions, geysers, and the heavens opening. The historic record reads in Genesis 7 and verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month. The word of God is accurate. 
to the day, to the hour. On that day, all the fountains of the great earth were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So for the people of planet earth, the flood was sudden and unexpected. And they were taken away. The first illustration is judgment by flood. The second illustration that Jesus gave is judgment by fire. And the second illustration regards the man Lot. Lot and some of his family believed, but the rest of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah did not believe. We read in Genesis 19 and verse 12. Then the men said to Lot, Have you have (coughs) then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because of the outcry against them has grown up great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Then Lot went up from Zoar and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him. That's all. Lot and two daughters. Only three escaped. All the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah did not believe the warning. For them the fire in brimstone was sudden and unexpected. So Jesus says in verse 28, Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So when Jesus returns to set up his kingdom, some are going to be believing, but the vast majority of the world's population will not be believing. And for them, it will be sudden and unexpected. Just as judgment came on the world in Lot's day, and judgment came... Uh, in Noah's day, and judgment came on Sodom and Gomorrah in Lot's day. Judgment will come on planet Earth. The terrible day is described in Revelation 19 and verse 12, um, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. The one who is faithful and true is Jesus And with righteousness he judges and makes war, because this is judgment. His eyes are like a flame of fire. He knows all things. On his head were many crowns, for he has all authority. He had a name written that no one one knew except himself. What's that name? No one knows except himself. He was clothed with a road dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he shall strike the nations. So in other words, with his word he strikes the nations. He says, and it is so. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. You meet the, eat the flesh of kings, of captains, flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. Now I'm passing on this warning from the scripture to you today so that for you too, that for you it will not be sudden and unexpected. A warning from God, dear friend, is a great mercy. A great mercy. I I plead with you not to ignore it. People will make fun of the warnings like, like they did of Noah with Noah and Lot. But the words of the Lord are true and he will enact all his counsel. Please today throw yourself on the mercy of God. Call out to him with all urgency. Third, when the cunning kingdom arrives, it will be selective. 
Now, this has already been suggested by the illustrations of Noah and Lot, but uh, Jesus emphasizes the selectivity of the coming kingdom. He emphasizes it now. So be ready, dear friend, be ready. Verse 31 says, In that day, he who is on the housetop, and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. When the captain of the aeroplane says, evacuate, 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 you do not grab your stuff. You head for that opening, you head for that door, and you get out because you have seconds to live. And in the day, the great day of our Lord Jesus, you do not grab your stuff. You do not turn back to get it. You look to him, and you do not turn back. Verse 32 says, remember Lot's wife. Well, we didn't read what happened to Lot's wife, did we? Any doubt, any hesitation will be fatal. Remember what Lot, Lot's wife, for she did not escape the judgment of God that day. It was only Lot and his two daughters. Remember Lot's wife. She, she was not one of the three who believed and escaped. She looked back. So let's apply this to our lives here and now. Verse 33. <clears throat> Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. You cannot have your best life now and survive because if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. You cannot do it your way and live because if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. You cannot be captain of your own ship, it's going to sink because if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. You cannot be at the steering wheel of your own life. That, that vehicle is going to crash if you seek to save your life you will lose it. You cannot be following your whims, making your own choices, for it will not turn out well. You want to be in control of your own life? You lose. You, you let Jesus control your life? You win. Verse 33 says, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Jesus gave his life for you. Now give your life to him. Do not try to maintain control because that would mean you're not ready for the Lord's return. Fourth, when the king kingdom comes, it's going to be final. That's probably the word you need. It will be final. But it's also going to be worldwide. The sudden, unexpected and selective return of the Lord Jesus will be worldwide. On one side of the world it is night. Verse 34 says, I tell you in that night there will be two men on one bed. The one will be taken and the other left. But on the other side of the world it is day. Verse 35 says, two women will be grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Those who are taken are taken in judgment. Those who are left are left to enter into the kingdom of God which will be both physical and spiritual. It's final, it's finished, it's done. There will be corpses everywhere and the birds are invited to come as we've already read in Revelation 19. And so Jesus finishes in verse 37. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said, Where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. It will be worldwide. Just as the world was taken in judgment and Noah and his family were left for a new start. Just as, Lot and his, um, just as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were taken and Lot and his two daughters were left for a new start, so the world, the, all the people of this world will be taken and those who have believed will be left uh, for a new start. It's final. I was reading about a sister named Lee. One day when visit, visiting the market, uh, Lee was given a scripture tract, a, a gospel tract. She read the tract and she was intrigued and she was drawn to that soul-piercing message. Repeatedly she read it to the point that she memorized the verses that were on it. It were these. Firstly, Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like the laundress's soap. But if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. She accepted without doubt and trusted with all of her heart. There there was no church in her village and there was no person that she could go to for understanding. Sadly, some false teachers came through teaching uh, and confused Lee. She knew this message was different from the track that she'd read, but she couldn't understand and she wanted a Bible. Later, local evangelists were visiting the area. Uh, This was toward the end of 2020, giving out gospel tracts to passers-by. Lee was delighted when she saw them, and she went to them and and asked the questions that were in her heart. The evangelist reminded her of the pure, pure gospel, and he gave her a Bible so that she was able to read for herself. She had a great hunger for God's word. Reading it encouraged her faith. Two months later, the evangelist came back again, and he found that she had led four others to Christ, and they were meeting together in in her home. She said to the evangelist, this book is living. The Lord is speaking to me through his word. The truth of the Bible gives me comfort and warmth. We are beloved of the Heavenly Father. Now I want that for you. Maybe you don't like what I've said today. Maybe it seems too hard to you. But dear friend, if you were heading for a cliff, I'd say, stop, turn back, because I want your life to be saved. That's what I'm doing today. I'm saying, stop, turn back, that you might know the Lord Jesus. If you are drowning, I hope that I would throw you a lifeline, that you might not drown. I'm trying to throw you the lifeline of the gospel today. I've tried to give warning so that you want to grab that rope. You don't think everything's okay. You know that you need to be saved. Jesus is certainly coming. So I want you to be ready. I warn you, but it's not scare tactics. I'm attempting a rescue today. I want for you that relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to have the joy and the peace that Lee had. I I don't want you to meet Jesus Christ in judgment. I, I want you to meet him with that peace and joy in your hearts. Do you understand what you need to do today? Jesus gave his life for you. He died in your place. Now you give your life to him. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died in my place. But that's not enough. You you turn from the way you're going. You give your life to him. He who knew no sin took your place on the cross. You need to turn to him with all of your heart, like Lee, before it's too late. Don't forget to be ready. Don't forget to be ready. Please be ready. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to pray for those that are with us today. I'm grateful that there are many brothers and sisters here. I don't know every heart you do, Lord. Would you speak to the hearts that need need you today, that need to be saved, that need to turn from just living their life for themselves, buying and selling and marrying and giving in marriage and going through the routine of life. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, you would reach into souls. And I pray that you would pull them up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay and place their feet upon a rock, the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. You would save them, dear Heavenly Father. I pray.